and welcome to the Churchill Club. Our program this evening is called Our Apple's Best Days Ahead. The genesis of the program was a note that I received from a friend of the Churchill Club, Shernaz Daver. I think Shernaz is here tonight, who observed that three major books by um, wonderful, thoughtful writers on different aspects of Apple were coming out within mere months of one another. And so we talked about it and came up with the idea of assembling this fine group of folks to compare notes. And um, to us, it represented a chance to surface valuable and positive insights about this company that has played such a huge role in the industry and in many of our lives. I'd like to welcome our speakers, Leander and Yukari and Fred and our moderator, Adam. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. And we would especially also like to acknowledge SRI for their partnership and for making this event possible. For those who don't know, uh, some of Apple's successes map directly back to SRI. For instance, it was here that the computer mouse was invented and patented back in the 1960s. And Apple was an early licensee. And the mouse was first used commercially on the Apple Macintosh in 1984. And then more recently, SRI invented Siri. And uh, of course, the first virtual personal assistant. And uh, Apple purchased Siri in 2010 after SRI spun it out a few years prior to that. And it came out in 2011 in the iPhone. And the rest is kind of history as far as using voice technology in some of our everyday devices. SRI has very broad shoulders that many folks and many companies are standing on, not just Apple. So I think it's really important to acknowledge them. And it's a privilege to be here. Thank you, Alice, for having us. Thank you. Um, for our new guests in the audience, a brief introduction to Churchill Club, a nonprofit devoted to innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. We began in Silicon Valley in 1985 as a forum where important people say important things at the nexus of business and technology, academia, and policy. And since then, its scope has broadened uh, very much alongside the expanding role of technology itself on so many aspects of our world. And we convene up to 40 programs every year to advance collective thinking and bring people together around leadership, trends, implications, strategies, opportunities, et cetera. And we always encourage our speakers to say something that matters, to build on what's out there, and not to repeat the insights, and just to try to advance the thinking. And we certainly welcome you all to join us and remain close to the extraordinary conversations that we convene on a regular basis. Our next program is on March 18 in Santa Clara with two individuals who have unique personal perspectives on uh, topics such as the future of entertainment, media, education. They are Qualcomm EVP Peggy Johnson and Liberty Media CEO Greg Maffei. We anticipate a really interesting conversation that will be um, probably quite surprising, so we hope you'll join us. If you're tweeting tonight, please use the hashtag Churchill Club, and you'll find other Twitter codes in your printed programs. Our moderator, Adam Lashinsky, covers Silicon Valley and Wall Street for Fortune. And he is also a, the author of the 2012 Wall Street Journal bestseller, bestseller, Inside Apple, How America's Most Admired and Secretive Company Really Works. You can see Adam weekly on the Fox News Channel, in particular on Cavuto on Business on Saturday mornings. And he also co-chairs Fortune's annual Brainstorm Tech Conference. We're always honored to have him come back to our stage. Please give Adam your warmest welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, the four of us on this stage have something in common, have many things in common, uh, among them that we've each written books about Apple. As journalists uh, writing about Apple, we know that Apple can be uh, one of the most interesting, most difficult, most controversial, thorniest of topics. And everybody in the room obviously shares the fascination, or, or you wouldn't be here this evening. So we're going to have a conversation amongst ourselves for a while, and then we're going to bring you into the conversation. I'd, I'd like to uh, start off by acknowledging the, the title of the evening is Our, Our Apple's Best Days 
ahead of us. There's a very obvious corollary to that question that isn't in the program, which is, are Apple's des best days behind it? And uh, we're going we're gonna to try to draw that out of, of, our, of our panelists. I want to ask each of you to take about one minute to introduce yourselves um, to, to the audience, your name, your, you know, w the places where you've worked in, in your career. And why don't you uh, start off by saying your Twitter handle out loud so people know it. Mine is at Adam Lashinsky, by the way. Fred, you start. Okay. I'm, <coughs> I'm uh, at uh, F. Vogelstein. Um, I am a contributing editor at Wired. Uh, the book is called Dogfight, How Apple and Google Went to War and Started a Revolution published by Sarah Crichton Books, FSG, last November. Uh, been a staff writer for the Wall Street Journal, for Fortune, for US News and World Report. Uh, been a journalist for about 25 years and uh, covered tech for about 15. Yukari? Uh, my Twitter handle is at Yukari Kane, Y-U-K-A-R-I Kane, K-A-N-E. I was last uh, a Wall, uh, Wall Street Journal reporter covering Apple. Uh, I covered Apple during uh, Steve Jobs' last days. Um, and uh, my book is called Haunted Empire, Apple After Steve Jobs. And it uh, just tracks what uh, Apple's been doing over the last couple of years. Leander? Mine is uh, at L. Caney. Uh, and um, I had a book out in November, too, called Johnny Ive the genius behind Apple's greatest products. And it was a first full-length biography of uh, Sir Jonathan Ive, Apple's head designer. Um, and uh, I run my own uh, blog called Cult of Mac, um, which I've been running for about five years now, independently. And before that, I was um, the news editor at Wired.com. And I spent about 12 years at Wired, uh, working as a reporter covering Apple. Um, and I had three books out of that. Um, and then rose up to be the technology editor, managing editor, and then the news editor of the whole site. Great. So I, I think I'll start in the same order, and I'll start with you, Fred. And I'll ask you, are Apple's best days ahead of it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I really want Apple's best days to be ahead of it. I'm a little worried uh, about, about that. Um, I'm worried because it's uh, in a platform war with Google uh, over the future of mobile. And I think it's losing. Uh, and I would like to see it do some stuff over the course of the next year that would reverse that. Would reverse that. Uh, but one of the things that we've come to understand about platform wars uh, from not just seeing what Microsoft was able to do uh, with, with Windows, but also companies like eBay and auctions, Google and uh, search advertising, Facebook and social networking, is that in the world of technology, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of platforms tend to be winner-take-all uh, sorts of affairs. And uh, with Apple's market share uh, continuing to fall in the mobile world, I'm a little worried that uh, it has to do something uh, pretty impressive over the course of the next uh, few months if it's going to reverse that. Um, I think the bottom line here, a lot of people push back on me when I say that because they point out that it's not just a market share game. And I would agree with that. The, point is, the, the problem is, is that Google is uh, also starting to catch up when it comes to helping developers make money. Uh, yeah, let me, let me pause you for a second. So there's, there's, different, there's two different types of shares you might want to talk about. One is, you're saying that Apple is losing unit share in mobile devices. Right. It's having started with a very high share of smartphone and tablet units, yes. right? But there's also the issue of you were starting to get to units of market share in apps or market share of money, of revenue associated with apps. Are you making the case that they're losing share rapidly in both of those measurements? Um, I don't know whether or not they're losing share rapidly. They're certainly losing share rapidly in unit sales, but they're also starting to um, lose their dominance in uh, the other end of things, which is how much money they make for developers. So three years, so three years ago, um, the fight between Google and Apple when it, when it comes to, when it came to 
uh, the health of the ecosystem and making money for software developers as a platform wasn't even close. Apple was making all the money for developers. Google was making virtually none. Um, in the past three years, and especially last year in 2013, Google's share of revenue from uh, app sales has really started to explode. I mean, it, we're, it's now at the point where I think Google's revenue is about 35% of what uh, Apple's total revenue is. Um, when Google's revenue then gets to, when Google's revenue gets to 50% uh, or more, um, I think that's going to be trouble for Apple. And Fred, one quick thing. When you say they've got to do something in the next several months, why, why would you say the next several months? Well, I think that... In other words, why so soon? Why, why is it so urgent? Well, I think it's, I think Apple's, if you think about Apple as a company over the course of the past 15 years, um, it's a company that has essentially uh, built its business on three or four critical products. Um, the iPod, iTunes, iPhone, uh, iPad. All of those products were what you might call boil the ocean kinds of things uh, that really turned the world on its ear. Um, and as competitors started to catch up to each one, Apple came up with a yet another product to kind of move the ball, move the ball further ahead. Um, it's been four years uh, since the iPad was introduced. That's starting to push the envelope uh, in terms of gaps between products. Uh, I don't know that um, Apple should go more than five years uh, between earth-changing products for its uh, long-term health. Okay, perfect. Let, we're going we're gonna to put a pin in that, uh, that element of the conversation and come back to it. I want to okay. give Yukari a chance to, to at a, you know, starting at the high level to answer the question, wh which is it, Yukari, best days ahead of it or best days behind it? I think, it's, uh, I think it's too soon to tell, but what's clear is that uh, Apple is struggling now to, to find a new vision, uh, to find a new identity uh, for uh, post-Steve Jobs Apple. How, how do you know they're struggling to find a vision, to find an identity? Well, for, for one, I mean, you have Tim Cook out there saying, you know, one hand that nothing has changed about Apple. Apple is still uh, the same as it has ever been. And he also, but he also, by the same uh, breath, talks about Steve Jobs' last words to, Apple, uh, to Tim, which was uh, to not think about what I would do, do what's right. And I think that Apple knows that it needs to do that, but it's struggling to find, figure out a way to do that and yet still um, stay true to to their, their past legacy or DNA or whatever you want to call it. But see, here's where we have, we have plenty of time to air this out. And what I, what I want you to address, and I'm going to, because I'm and then playing on something that Fred said is, and I sort of, I don't have the answer to this question. Mm -hmm. Where is the evidence that Apple is struggling right now? Where is the evidence that Apple is falling down in, in any aspect of what they're doing? I think, um, I'm not saying that they're falling down. I think, you know, if, uh, from a profit perspective, from a revenue perspective, they're doing really, really well. But the promise of Apple isn't profits and revenues. The promise of Apple is to make insanely great products that, that um, delight everybody. And, you know, my question is, when was the last time that Apple did that? Okay. Leander, best days in front of it, best days behind it. I think uh, definitely the best days are ahead of it. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, rumors of its death are greatly exaggerated. I think um, that, um, you know, people were spoiled in the last couple of years, uh, but just before Steve died, they had the iPad and uh, the iPhone, and these were probably two of the biggest changes in the technology industry in 30 years. And so now they seem to think that, well, they should, Apple should be coming out with this sort of stuff every two or three years. And I think there's tons of evidence that they're working on some... Uh, you know, some, some very important stuff in, in, inside the labs. What's the evidence? Well, all the wearables. You know, they're looking, they're hiring a whole bunch of engineers with expertise in biosensing, biotechnology. Things like chips that can stare into your capillaries and measure your blood glucose, uh, as well as your heartbeat, um, 
your metabolic rate, um, your respiratory rate, how much oxygen is in your blood. And, you know, this is like a, a Fitbit on super steroids. It's not just going to tell you how many steps you took that day. It'll possibly, maybe, give you a snapshot of your real-time blood chemistry. And I think, you know, the, the implications of that are quite far-ranging, not just for health monitoring, but also for things like diet and well-being, for, um, you know, telling you about your own circadian rhythm, sleep, activity. Um, so, so we're clear, you're, you're speculating based on observations of Apple hiring practices, is that right? Yeah, and yeah, exactly, yeah, it's all about hiring practices and, and about the companies that they took these engineers and these scientists and these specialists from and the kind of things that they were getting into, yeah. Talk a little bit about your thesis that Johnny Ive is far more important and relevant to this story than people understand. Is that is that a fair representation of your thesis? Absolutely, yeah. And of Talk course, about that. Uh, this is you know what my book was arguing um, that he didn't get his fair share of um, credit for Apple's success this last dozen years because the company is so secretive and because it only had essentially one spokesperson. Um, all of the credit was given to Steve Jobs. And that's not to say that Steve isn't a, a spectacular genius and a, and a singular genius. And, and, you know, obviously you can see the fruits of his labors. Um, but, you know, he was a member of a, of a, I think the most important part of the, the heart of the company, its ideas factory, it's that, you know, where all the innovation came from is Johnny I's design lab. And the 16, 20 designers, I, you know, no one knows how many people work there because it's so secretive, but the 20 odd designers that work there, this is where all the ideas came from. And Jobs, towards the end of his career at Apple, Tim Cook took over the day-to-day -day and ran the company day-to-day -to, -day to give Steve the time to hang out in the design lab and sort of become one of the members of Johnny Ive's design team. And, you know, as Johnny Ive said in his um, tribute to, after Steve died, that, you know, Steve had some great ideas, but he also had some nutty ideas too. Um, and I think he was, you know, he, obviously uh, he had a lot of power in that team, but it, he didn't direct what they did. He would throw in ideas. Sometimes they were crazy, sometimes they were great. And I think that team is still there. It's still functioning without him. I think it's still operational. It, there may be a, a hole in its heart without him, but it nonetheless is, is operating the same way that it had done for the last 12 years or so. It's really interesting. You're, you're positioning Steve Jobs as having been a member of Johnny Ive's design team. Yeah. That was his uh, <laughs> ultimate contribution. <laughs> Well, they used to fight all the time. Well, not fight. They would, you know, Johnny doesn't fight with anybody. Steve would like yell and scream, but Johnny would, you know, he would, he would, he managed up. And I heard this over and over again. I mean, they had everyone had this. Everyone knew all the veterans of the company had ways of managing Steve. And and the 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 simplest trick was to if you had something great to show him, the last thing you did was was show it to him in isolation. You always got two sacrificial lambs. So you, you cooked up two things that you know he's going to reject. And you show it to him first, and then he can say, that's shit, that's rubbish, and, and, and reject them, and then show him what you want him to pick. And I heard this from engineers, software programmers, designers. The designers did it all the time with the prototypes. They showed him in the lab. You know, he would often come in and see what they're working on, and they'd always have a range of stuff, and most of it was sacrificial. And they would never show him anything they didn't want him to see and to choose, so they were, they were directing him. Okay, Yukari, Leander is saying that... Uh Yes, Steve Jobs was important, but would you would you react to that, please? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that um, you know Johnny did say that Steve had a lot of nutty ideas, but I think Steve would say that Johnny had a lot of nutty ideas as well, and you know that goes that goes both ways. Um, you know, I, I guess I would come back to what Steve always said. Uh, you know, he stood on the intersection of technology and art, and. Um, you know, and I think that Johnny is um, a brilliant designer, but he, but the fact, the definition of an industrial designer is that you stand on art. And so, um, you know, he's not a business person, and uh, so, so he's not, um, you know, he, he's not the one to lead Apple. It's got to be somebody else. Okay, so give us your assessment of where the, of what the absence of Steve Jobs means to Apple in 2014. Um, Steve, well, the absence of Steve Jobs is uh, is um, is losing the the halo effect. Steve 
Steve commanded this, this attention and this a level of celebrity um, to Apple. And uh, I think that without Steve, you, first of all, there's a, there's a, there's a perception issue. Um, Apple is treated more as an ordinary company. I mean, there's, no, um, there's nobody else that has the moral authority that Steve had to, uh, to take the kind of risks that made Apple so successful in the past. And that hurts Apple, whether the talent is there or not. So, Fred, here's my thought on the, you know, you said four years, five years is getting on a really long time. There were, there were five years between the iPod and the iPhone. I, I believe it's five, maybe six years. Then we had the iPhone and the iPad in, in, in three years succession. But if Apple comes out with something as big as the iPad next year, mm -hmm. will all be forgiven? Yeah, I think it probably will be. I mean, I, I think Apple has, uh, you know, one of the things that Apple is managing, though, is uh, it has to, Apple has to do, at this point, Apple has to manage uh, a couple of different things. It has to manage not only uh, the innovation quotient, which is however many years between new ideas, uh, it wants to, Apple has to manage the whole innovation quotient, so it has to actually figure out how far it can go before it comes up with the next idea that boils the ocean. Um, but then it also has to manage uh, its existing products. Uh, so it has to manage its iPhone market share and developer ecosystem. It has to manage its iPad market share and developer ecosystem. And uh, it, if it lets too much time go between coming up with the next killer product, um, that that then the pre then the previous products start to decay at a faster rate than I think Apple would like. Because the issue that because the thing that makes Apple unique actually among a lot of companies is that uh, and what makes it actually has made it so successful is is that Apple's genius is, is that it takes very, very complicated uh, ideas, products, and makes them incredibly beautiful and really easy to use. I mean, so it did that with the music player, of which there were many. Uh, it did that with the cell phone, of which there were many. It did that with the iPad, of which there were many. Um, it should do that with um, the television because, gosh knows, um, it's become difficult to uh, watch TV in terms of deciding which content stream you're actually going to get your content from. So are you going to watch uh, a Roku box? Are you going to watch um, an Apple TV box? Are you going to watch Hulu? Are you going to watch Amazon? Are you gonna, it, it's starting to become complicated. And so all, my only point is, is that um, Apple needs to move Apple needs to, I hope Apple has a really killer idea in the pipeline because it can't continue to do what it's doing in an incremental way. But you also believe, don't you, that even if they do have a killer idea in the pipeline, that it's, they're going to be crippled because they don't have Steve Jobs bringing the plane in for a landing. Don't you, don't you believe that? Um, I'd like to be wrong about that. Um, I mean... You know, Leander, Leander makes some really, really great points um, in terms of uh, the power and sophistication of Johnny Ive. Uh, I worry that neither Johnny nor, um, nor Tim Cook have the capacity to take the kind of risk that with Apple that Steve Jobs was able to take. So, I mean, the thing that I guess is different, the thing that makes me worry a little bit about Apple without Steve is that if you think about the iPhone in particular, but all the, but all the products, but let's focus on the iPhone, um, Apple essentially had to bet the company in order to make the iPhone successful. If the iPhone had failed, I think Apple as a company, uh, remember this is going back into 2006, um, Apple as a company would have been in 
some trouble um, because uh, it had pulled engineers from all around the company to work on the iPhone. It had pulled the best engineers to, all, to work on the project. And it had, as a result, uh, dried up its whole product pipeline. So if the iPhone had not been successful, not only would you have had a bunch of disillusioned engineers who have d would have decided to go to work maybe elsewhere, but you also would have had a product pipeline that was probably uh, um, that was empty and probably would have taken a year or two or three to fill up again. And so I guess I kind of worry that Apple doesn't have um, the that Tim and Johnny, as brilliant as both of them are, um, they don't have the same kind of uh, ability to bet the company the way Steve did. And I sometimes think, I think that that's actually the difference between um, success and failure uh, here. For Apple. Go ahead, Leanne. Well, I mean, that's a great point. I think the biggest difference, obviously, you know, nobody has that. Um, Steve was a, a burn the boats kind of guy, and he did it time and time again. Um, where he would bet the company. I mean, uh, the iPod Mini, I think, was a good example. You know, that was at one time the most popular iPod, and he's, he decided that the iPod Nano was going to be a successor, and so he completely killed the Mini. And Tim Cook is never going to do that, and Johnny Ive is never going to do that with any of their products. But I think, you know, it doesn't matter because th this is not a company in decline. On, and, you know, it, by any standards, I think the numbers that you cite, um, Apple just sold historic numbers of iPads and iPhones. Right. And it's losing market share because the market is hockey sticking. It's growing so fast that Apple is, you know, Apple is still growing, but it's not as growing as fast as Samsung. But Tim Cook and Apple would argue that it doesn't matter because Android phones aren't really smartphones. They're fancy dumb phones. <laughs> <laughs> and that people aren't using them. They're not buying software. They're not using them for smartphone activities. Well, see, this, is the thing, th th this is the thing that I've been paying a lot of attention to, actually, because, I, because, when, it comes to, because when it comes to, for actually m until last year, th that was actually absolutely right. I mean, one of the issues that um, Android had was that the platform was fragmented. Um, so that there were probably four different operating systems out there, or and more. or more, right? Well, I mean, so, so I mean, it, certainly, certainly four, maybe, maybe more, but four is four is a lot. Uh, um, and the Google Play Store was kind of a disaster for uh, developers to um, for consumers to actually find apps in. Um, but over the course of the past. Especially over the course of the past two years, Google has fixed both of those things. Um, and so as a result, Android is no longer, it's, it's exerted a huge amount of control of... Fixed it. They're trying well, look, to fix it. Okay, so quick question. I don't want to divert too much into talking about Google, only because it's not the, the point of the evening. No, but that's for, true. For any of the three of you, how do we know that Tim Cook or, and Johnny Ive won't kill something uh, the way that Steve, that Steve Jobs would have. How can we say that with such confidence? Because it's not, their, it's not his company. Um, but, you know, again, I go back to the moral authority. But, I mean, Apple was Steve's company. He could do what he wanted. I mean, Tim Cook has to uh, answer to shareholders, to consumers, to people inside the company that will second guess him. He, he's got um, a lot of people looking out. I mean, I had a very interesting conversation with John Scully, um, former CEO, former of, CEO Apple. of Apple, about what happened after Steve left the first time. And he said to me that uh, you know, the board was uh, questioned him much more closely on the same kinds of decisions that Steve would have been allowed to make. I mean, it became a lot harder to make big decisions. But the the, the playbook says, this: we are Apple, we think big, we take big bets, we swing for the fences, etc. Isn't it possible that because that is what the playbook says, that that's what Tim Cook will do, and we just haven't seen him do it yet? He's not the kind of person to make, a, make big swings. I mean, if... Tell uh, everybody, why not? Why is he not that person? Because his, um, he was an operations expert. He, his... His expertise, I mean, he's a brilliant man, but his expertise is about 
numbers and data and analysis. Uh, he's famous for, for, you know, scanning sheets of papers and retaining everything. But you need to. He doesn't make decisions unless there is unless you can show why that's going to be a good decision. He likes to look, he likes to look at spreadsheets. Yeah. Steve Jobs yeah. did not. Right. I know I just said, Fred, we shouldn't talk too much about Google, but is your opinion that Larry Page is more Steve Jobs-like and that that's why Google has the advantage over Apple right now? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, like, I mean, it, and I don't know whether or not it's actually has to do with Larry Page being more Steve Jobs-like as much as Larry Page is a founder um, and... Larry Page is a co-founder of Google. And as a result of being a co-founder of Google, just like Bill Gates was a co-founder was a co-founder of Microsoft, um, that get, just as Mark Zuckerberg is a I guess a co-founder of Facebook. Um, um, I, I was gonna say founder, but I momentarily um, <laughs> remembered that there were a bunch of other people there too. Um, my point is is that when you're when you're the co-founder of a company, that gives you the not, that gives you the ability to take risks um, and get people within the company to follow you in a way that um, professional managers don't have in a way that professional managers don't have that kind of latitude so I don't think that Tim Cook or any executive would have been allowed to take the kind of risk with Apple as a corporation that Steve Jobs took in order to get the iPhone built. Um, and, you know, and the kinds of risks that they took to get the iPhone built are not trivial. I mean, they, uh, and the kinds of switching um, and changing courses that, um, they took while they were um, building the iPhone were going on really right up until um, the phone was available for sale. I mean, one of the things that most people don't realize um, is that when Steve actually demoed the iPhone and we all saw it and we all saw it and remember it um, for the first time, it looked, he made it look like something that we all wanted to go out and buy in stores right away and the fact that we had to wait six months was incredibly frustrating because what he had on stage looked so perfect. The reality was that there were only about a hundred prototy iPhone prototypes in existence at that point. They hadn't even set up a, man set up a manufacturing line. On top of that, um, people were so worried that the demo was going to fail that a bunch of engineers in the fifth row were, 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 passing, flas were passing a flask of scotch because they were doing shots in the audience. Okay, so, so you, you're making the, you, you two are making the case that part of the genius of Steve Jobs and then the craziness of Steve Jobs was this willingness to make these huge gut calls, very risky. They worked out more often than they didn't, and the company achieved this amazing Correct. greatness as a result. No rational CEO, no rational company would ever behave this way. And in fact, Tim Cook is a rational CEO and Apple's a rational company. That's good in lots of ways, but not good if you want to shoot the moon. Correct. Um, w one of the things we're all agreed on is that Apple hasn't done anything mind-blowing since Steve Jobs died. In fact, they've done some things that aren't particularly good. Yukari, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, I think um you know, I, I, Apple, to me, is a company that um, promises to make insanely great products. And um, I, I, I want to talk specifically about yeah. Maps no. and yeah, Siri sorry. and whatever else you would, whatever else might make this case that the company has, is, well, is Maps, off a beat. I mean, Maps was interesting because, you know, it's, it is a complicated technology, but they went out with something half-baked. I mean, there were, I mean, the, the, the bugs were just incredible. I mean, finding, um, I think my favorite was uh, putting the, um, putting uh, Antarctica in, in, in the Indian Ocean or something like that. And, um, and, and so the question is what, um, how did that happen? Yeah, it goes beyond anecdotes. It was a bad product, period. It was a bad product, yeah. period. How did it happen? And, and, and how did it happen? And, um, you know, something in the development process obviously broke. Um, you know, Steve 
Steve would have never allowed that. I mean, I don't think. Um, Leander? Well, I think, does yes. This, does this debunk your thesis that no, no, the great Johnny <laughs> Ive was not able to save us from Apple Maps? Steve, everything is really compartmentalized at Apple. And, and you know, uh, you know uh, until Johnny Ive took over software as well as hardware, you know, Steve was the only one who straddled both of those sort of uh, big divisions in the company. And um, as far as I know, you know, Siri for sure was um, introduced under, you know, when he was still there, he was... Um, he saw it uh, just before, a right. few oh, months before yeah. he died, right? Yeah. So, and, and Steve had plenty of um, mistakes. Uh, the whole antenna gate. In fact, the Cube, the, the Paramount Cube, was the company that almost sank Apple back in the early 2000s. That was a big bet the company um, product that um, almost put them out of business. They were lucky to survive that. Um, the reason I think Steve has this reputation as such a risk taker is because they were in such deep trouble for so long that they only survived because they had a string of hits. I mean, that was the whole, that's the, that, that is Apple's obus mop, uh, I mean, I modus operandi, is yeah, hit one hit after yeah. another. But I don't think they're in a position now at all to be, have to risk the company. I mean, I guess I don't, Google I don't, isn't. I mean, you would never say that anything that Google does is a risk the company product. And I think Apple is now in that similar situation where they have a stable enough business base to be able to make lots of small bets, just like Google does. But Apple doesn't do that. They does it in the lab, behind the scenes. This is why we haven't seen anything for four years, because they're cooking it up see, actually, in the design lab. See, I actually hope you're right. I mean, because By I, the way, Fred, when you say you hope he's right, why do you, why do you hope? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm serious. As the, as the great objective journalist that you are, why do you, why do you give a shit if they, uh, if they succeed or fail? Well, because I well, well, cause I, cause I use because I use an iPhone. I mean, you know, because I like Apple because I like Apple products. I mean, I, I'm, I, I think they make I think they make really cool I think they make really cool products that I like to use. And on top of that, I think that the competition that exists between Google and Apple right now. Um, is actually good for consumers. I mean, it's forcing this. It's driving down the price of cell phones. It's driving um, up the kinds of features that w we consumers are getting a chance to use. And so I think um, Apple being super competitive uh, is an important part of the creative uh, of the creativity that exists in the mobile universe. Um, I, I appreciate that. And I was mostly teasing you, but I don't want to take you <laughs> off your point, which was to answer Leander. Because what's wrong, what, you know, you say you hope he's right that becoming more, trying lots of things can work for them the way it uh, works for Google. You say you hope he's right, but? Well, I mean, there's, there, is a, there is a point of view, there is a point of view that Apple um, has gotten big enough and successful enough that it can essentially operate the same way that BMW or Mercedes um, operates uh, in the car business, which is that um, it doesn't have to have a huge market share um, because it can sell a premium product for a premium price and, uh, and make tons of money with single, digit, with single digit market shares. The problem is, and if that actually turns out to be the case, that's going back to my previous point, I'm happy. The problem is, is that historically it doesn't work that way in Silicon Valley. Um, so, I mean, historically, going back to my earlier point, these are platform wars. And historically, in platform wars, the winner dr creates enough network effects to sort of pretty much drive out most of, most of the other competitors. And unfortunately, even though we all kind of we remember, we can all point to Microsoft and the way it was able to do that. That isn't the only example. Um, so there were half a dozen auction companies before eBay came up with a plan to sort of allow people buying and selling stuff to talk to each other and um, that turned out to be a killer feature. And all of a sudden everybody started using eBay because everybody else started using eBay. There are no more uh, competitors in the auction business. Um, same thing with Google and um, search advertising. The reason that, um, I mean, there was a, 
once a debate about whether or not Microsoft or Yahoo, I mean, when I first started writing about Google in 2002 and 2003, the prevailing wisdom was that Yahoo and um, Microsoft were going to kick its butt. Um, but ultimately, Google created network effects that allowed it to um, build a moat around the search advertising business and keep competitors out. Facebook has done the same thing. So what I see happening in mobile is the same thing. And so I don't, I'd like to believe that Apple's current situation is stable, but I fear that it is not. And history suggests it's not. Yeah, I think everyone, you know, compares the, the current platform wars to the old platform wars where Microsoft won. But there's another great analogy, which is the games business, the games consoles, you know, and there's, there's always been a very healthy, um, system of different competing consoles and even though some have it, there's been lots of peaks and troughs and some have dominated you know a lot of the players have managed to ha maintain very very healthy businesses for a long long time you might add that apple was not a player in games up until five or six years ago right exactly has become a major player yeah. in one tiny corner of the games business well i know it's putting nintendo out of business i'm sorry it's putting nintendo out of business i don't i don't know i mean i would i would See, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I completely agree with that because yes, the games business has been the console business has been around for a while, but I don't know how great a business it it is. I mean, um, it was. I mean, it, uh, Xbox is uh, Xbox is awesome, um, but I don't know that it's considered to be like um, a huge money maker for Microsoft. So I want to um, pick up on a, a, a point Leander made that I think was fascinating with the three of you, which is. You, I agree completely. Apple screwed up all the time when Steve Jobs was alive, but they tended to be small mistakes, and he did a marvelous job of making sure that we didn't pay attention to them for very long. Pay hey, no attention to this, because I got this to show you, right? For any, for any of you, is Apple doing a good job of telling its own story right now? I think it's lost its narrative. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's, you know, going back to, to Syrian maps, um, you know, saying that they've made mistakes now isn't to say that Steve Jobs hadn't, has never made mistakes, but the kind of mistakes they're making now are the kind of mistakes that are just, are, are really profound and suggested a change in the way that Apple, things that Apple got so right are things that are going wrong. Like with Siri, it was, you know, the, that technology is complex, but it was a messaging issue mostly. I mean, you don't, you know, Apple used to say product is hero. When you go out with a new phone, you, you know, you, you go out with something that's, that's wondrous and great, and, 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 and what they chose to target in their advertising was, was a technology that wasn't working out great. I mean, at little things like that, the Maps fiasco, it, it's, it influences public perception, and as public perception changes, in an environment where people are already asking, are constantly looking at Apple to see what has changed, you start losing control of your narrative. Fred, have they lost their narrative? Lost yeah. control of their narrative? I don't know that they've lost control of it as much as they're just not embracing it. Um, I mean, so it's there for someone whether or not it's Tim Cook or Johnny Ive or somebody else to grab a hold of and uh, get our sort of, um, and to sort of draw us back in again. Um, I just haven't seen anybody do it yet. I mean, one of the things that, so Tim Cook, uh, the last time, um, about a year, was it a year ago? Ah, a little bit, a little bit less than a year ago, Tim Cook um, appeared um, at the D conference in Los in, in Los Angeles that um, Kara Swisher and Walt Mossberg put on, and um, he was in the same chair in the same venue that Steve Jobs had showed up three or four times uh, in years prior, um, and I watched I watched it and I felt. It was pretty obvious, if you watch Tim Cook in that situation and you watch Steve Jobs in that situation, it was pretty obvious what the difference was. Tim Cook was prepared only to talk about the 
existing box that Apple was thinking about um, right now. Whereas, um, and he found himself in a position where he was having to evade questions and not answer questions. And um, watching Steve Jobs in the same spot um, was like night and day. Um, he was not any more forthcoming, by the way, but he painted a picture of what um, the world, what his world looked like both in the past and going forward that I think that um, is lacking. Go ahead, Yukari. That just goes to the point that Tim Cook doesn't seem to have or has not told us what his Apple looks like, and I think that's where you see the struggle. Would you... Uh Changing gears, share with everybody your observations about Apple's manufacturing, which is something that Tim Cook ran very successfully. You know, I, um, I went to China. I went to Asia for three weeks to, um, to, to try to really understand that. And uh, what was really interesting is that Apple, everybody knows that Apple has its products made in China. And, um, and, 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 uh, as well as actually in Japan and other countries. I mean, they've, they've, Tim, Steve Jobs, so Steve Jobs makes these impossible demands of, you know, what, what he wants in a product. And the guy that has executed that is Tim Cook. He makes it happen. How does he make that happen? He makes that happen by, um, by making the supply, ch the, the supply chain do what, um, do what Apple wants, and, the, and, and what's interesting that's going on right now is that as, uh, so the supply chain gives in to these impossible demands about quality, about timing, about last minute changes, and the reward at the end was this huge, huge revenues, um, because Apple was selling millions and millions, and, and it was growing for a really long time, and as the growth has slowed, that reward has diminished and um, and that has changed the equation in the supply chain and that's a really interesting crack that I think is, is starting to appear that um, is not as obvious. Does, does that, can I ask a question? Does yes. Apple dominate the supply chain the way it, the way it used to? Because so much of its, so much of the money that Apple has made over the years has been because it actually um, was able to tell Foxconn and all the other um, contract manufacturers over there um, what to do and how to do it. I mean, does it have the same kind of control over those guys? It, I mean, it still does in the contracts it's in, but the question is, you know, how, how interested are companies in general and in, in the broader contract manufacturing industry? And, um, you know, I heard, you know, I was in Taiwan, I was in Tokyo, I was in, um, in Shenzhen, and I heard a lot of similar stories about Apple's hardball tactics. Um, you know, one that comes to mind was in, um, you know, in Japan, everybody knows the, the iPod, one of the old iPods with the mirror-like finish. And um, that was made, that, um, that backing was made by a very small company in Japan. And um, one day, Apple's operations team goes in and says, um, you know, we're going to bring this video camera in for training purposes. You know, it's just for training purposes. And, they, and they're taking video camera footage. A few months later, they move that contract to China. And they're doing that kind of thing yeah. all the time. And so what happens is that, you know, companies are less and less interested. And meanwhile, you've You're got... You're saying they videotaped the one company's processes right, and then stole right. the ideas and or, gave or, them to another know, contract manufacturer. I mean, an even, even worse story was, um, you know, a company who was told to who is told to invest in all this equipment to make, I think it was the iPhone 5, and it was suggested that they would get the business. And so they invest in all this equipment, they leverage the company, and then Apple denies them the contract because they're over-leveraged as a company. But, but, um, but, but, uh, ahead, yeah, I, I think Apple has it's had this reputation for some time, and mm -hmm. it is notorious in Asia for um, going to smaller companies and making these sort of handshake deals with them, saying that we'll take, but, but they'll develop the process for a new product, like the, the iPhone touchscreen. No one was making those. They teamed up with a company in Taiwan and um, told the, uh, the owner of the company, this private company, that they would, they would buy every, if he invested $100 million, 
in tooling up a, a factory to make iPhone capacitive touchscreens. They would buy every single one he could make. And they're, they're notorious for making these kind of deals with smaller manufacturers, figuring out these new manufacturing processes, and then taking it to Foxconn, where they can integrate it into their bigger lines and do it a lot cheaper. Um, but you know, in this case, so they've screwed over a lot of companies, and Tim Cook is, is, is really a hard ass for, do, you know, yeah. for that, doing you know, this kind of thing. But that has implications. Yeah, of course well, it does. But the smart companies stay one step ahead. Hold and, on, and yeah, I wanna, that's, that's where I wanted to ask you. Does it, as Leander points out, these hardball tactics, is, is not, it's not new. They've always been able to find somebody who wants to work with them. You're, is there any evidence that the game is up? You know, I don't think the game, I mean, I'm not saying that the game is up, but the equation is starting to change because the promise of this, the huge revenue at the end um, just isn't happening as much anymore. And meanwhile, you've got well, hold on, I, the I don't Android understand that, Yukari. The, the, the unit volume only grows. Because it's, but it's a growth based, you know, if, if when Apple was making triple digit growth, when um, it's, you know, it's, um, it was an attractive, like the growth, because, this, because these companies depend in a lot of ways on, on, on that growth because, um, you know, because the way they make money is, is in all kinds of ways, but one of the makes ways, you know, they, they make money is, is their stock value. Um, but I was, you know, what I'm trying to say is that um, the Android, the, the growth of the Android market makes it, um, all of a sudden makes this, other, you know, creates this other market where they could go. And I'm, you know, and I'm not saying that they're going to go away, but there are cracks. And I think that a lot of these, what I found was that a lot of the supply chain companies are, are doing their own soul, soul searching, exploring, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, China's a really complicated place. And part of what allows companies like Foxconn to, um, to, to flourish is the environment that the government makes and so creates for them. And, um, and so when Apple is not, so part of, so I guess, so part of the, the impact of Apple's slow growth is that the Chinese politicians are less inclined to help create the environment that mm. allows Apple to do this because there's less in it for them. You know, Shenzhen, um, a lot of the, the central pl uh, committee members are, are from this region that, that Foxconn and Apple made really wealthy, and now they're, they're moving the business to central China, but... Um, Apple's moving the business to central Foxconn China. Foxconn is building factories uh -huh. and things out there. Um, and those politicians have created this environment to make it um, in the hopes that it's, it's going to do to their careers what... Mm -hmm. Shenzhen has done to okay. other careers. We, um, we're about to go to Q&A. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you each one, one last question uh, that uh, people, I get asked a lot, and a lot of people in this room do business with Apple. Uh, what's your relationship with Apple like? I was just there. Um, Tim Cook and I had lunch yesterday, and um, he wished me the best of luck and, for, and said hi to all of you guys. Um, <laughs> Uh, Apple, I mean, I have the same relationship, I have the same relationship with Apple that um, a lot of people in my business, in our business have, which is um, I don't have a relationship with them officially at all. Um, I told them about the project that I was working on, um, told them what I was doing, kept them abreast of the project every step of the way. They didn't want to play any role in it whatsoever. Um, and that's this, totally, that's totally this, fine. This sounds very familiar to me. Yukari? Uh, it's, you know, pretty much the same with me. I mean, I, I, um, kept them in the loop throughout the process. Um, let them know about any twists and turns in my narrative, gave them opportunities to, to comment. And, um, you know, unsurprisingly, they, they haven't. Man, are you writing about them every day? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make any difference, I'm afraid, yeah. My relationship is totally dysfunctional. Codependent, I think, is the word. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, codependent? Well, it's a one-way street. It's you know, I keep on uh, banging on the windows, but uh, you know, th th nothing gets tossed back. Pretty interesting, huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is and this is sort of. I mean, this is self. This is totally self-serving. But I mean, certainly one question that I've wondered was 
under Steve, under Steve Jobs, Apple's approach to media relations was what we're talking about here, and it worked beautifully. Um, it benefited by it benefited from surprise. It benefited from uh, and whenever he unveiled a new product, the world came and uh, um, his announcements were broadcast all over the world. Um, the question probably should be asked as to whether as to whether or not under the current leadership that approach will that approach continues to generate the same kind of benefits or whether or not um, a different approach is necessary. I've had my shot. Now it's your turn. We'd like questions from the audience. We have a, at least one roving microphone, maybe two. And um, we'll start right here at the center table. I would appreciate it if you would introduce yourself before you ask your question, please. Sure. Um, Barbara French with Juniper Networks. So my question is pretty straightforward. I, I think a lot of the conversation we've heard tonight assumes that the next breakthrough Apple product is going to be a device. So I would ask you to contemplate, are you expecting a cloud product, a software product, or a device, or a combination? What's, what's going to save Apple in your eyes? Who would like to go first? I'll go. <laughs> go, Fred. <laughs> um, I, I, think the break, I, I think the breakthrough, I think the breakthrough product will um, not be a device. Um, I think the breakthrough product will, should be um, one that makes watching television easier. Um, I mean, right now... Uh, Hold on, you're, so you're suggesting that would be a service? Um, yes, I think that Apple has enough... If Apple spent... Um, it cost... A, I'll give you a for instance. It cost um, Netflix about $100 million um, a year to create House of Cards. Um, um, think, about, think about what Apple could do if it decided to spend $2 billion a year on content. Um, uh, it wouldn't have to make it, but it certainly could find people to produce it. And if all of a sudden, like, you didn't have to think about where you could go to get content um, outside of the cable networks, um, it might, it, 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 if they simplified the TV watching experience and create and, and brought in the content along with it, um, they'd solve a bunch of problems overnight. You okay? Um, I think there's two questions in there. What's the next product and what's going to save Apple? And um, in terms of the next product, I mean, I, I think there could be a lot of things. Um, I'm not, you know, but I'm more interested in your second question, which, which is what's going to save Apple. And, and I don't know the answer to that because the, my, you know, when you do the calculation mathematically, I mean, Apple has become so big. I think the last quarterly earnings revenues were something like $60 billion that mathematically, it's going to take a lot, a, a, probably it's most successful product ever to make even a percentage difference in uh, Apple's earnings. And um, so that's a tall order. Um, in the spirit of time, device, or software, or service? Uh, well, you know, Apple's products are always a combination of hardware, software, and services. And they're looking at three areas, wearables, TV, and we saw one today. Um, Automobiles, CarPlay, unveiled at the Geneva Motor Show, running in Volvos, Ferraris, and I think it's going to be in 16 different cars this year. This is a weird and, I think, significant departure for Apple, which is they're starting to do what Microsoft did, which is to get their software and their services to run on other people's hardware. Yeah. And it's turning, you know, cars, at the moment high-end cars, but probably within a few years, a lot of cars, mass market cars, into basically fancy iPhone docks. So should we be excited for them or terrified for them that they're being more like Microsoft? Well, you know, it, yeah, they have the same perils. You know, it's, um, I mean, what are the, these, uh, the CarPlay depends on maps, which sucks, and Siri, which sucks. So... Um, I thought you were the positive one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they're, both getting a lot, they're both getting a lot better. Um, in a similar vein, I'd, I'd just like a yes or no question from each of you. Uh, Tim Cook's been dropping these hints recently that it's not out of the realm of possibility that Apple would do a, meg, a mega multi-billion dollar acquisition. Yes or no, will they? In the next three years? Um. Mega, mega. <laughs> sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they should. No. Next question. Yeah, Steve Patterson, I write features for Quartz, uh, but uh, in terms of the next product category, I, I've completely discounted 
uh, something absolutely new that we've never seen before because you can't do that without iterative design and engineering and we'd know about it. You know, it's just impossible. The second problem is, is coming from $175 million uh, in, in historical revenues, 20% is about $25 billion. That's billion, a, $175 billion. Yeah, $175 billion, I mean. So it's clear it's television. You know, it's a $400 billion dollar, dollar market um, uh, per year. How do, they, how do they get there? Intel just, just fell on their sword on the business because they couldn't get enough content. And I don't think $2 billion does it. I think $20 billion is, is, is what it takes, or to buy the NFL is pro probably, probably $40 billion. And what do they get in the end? Everybody buys their cable internet and cable television together. So suddenly, the cable television guy, guys subsidize television for the internet. And so instead of your internet costing 50 bucks and your, your television costing 50 bucks, your television costs you 70 bucks. And your, I mean, your internet costs you 70 bucks and, and your television costs you 30. So how does Intel disintermediate the two? Apple. I mean, how does uh, Apple disintermediate the two so that they can actually sell a product to those people? And one last point, point. people in Hollywood, they don't sell by the drink. Okay, they want the money up front before they build content. All right. So how do they do it? Apple, uh, Fred? So, so it's, I mean, I actually think it's pretty, I actually think it's pretty straightforward. I mean, $2 billion is, a number I is a number I picked is a number I picked out of a hat because um, that seemed to be if it, if if you know Netflix seems to have done pretty well um, with just House of Cards and a couple of other and a couple of other shows. So if Apple spent um, if Apple could do twenty of those a year, um, that'd be kind of, that'd be kind of interesting. Fred, that, uh, that doing twenty houses House of Cards is not a mind-blowing change the world proposition. That's just buying a bunch of television shows. Um, if you make them yourself, it... They didn't make it themselves. They just wrote a check. Well, that's also, what I mean. Uh, Netflix wrote a check. But they, but they did it. But Netflix controlled, Netflix controlled the distribution. The point here yes. is... The point, the point here is, is that um, what most people don't... Most people think about Google and Apple as um, technology companies, and they are. Um, but what they've also created um, are essentially 21st century television networks um, who, with who, their, who? both Google and Apple. Uh -huh. So in terms of it, when you think about the amount of time that we, se that, that we spend looking at our phones or looking at our tablets, um, it rivals the amount of time that we spend looking at our televisions, mm. um, except it's Google and Apple that are on the other end of the phone and the tablets, not not Comcast. And so my only point is, when you look at Netflix success with House of Cards, there's a precedent for creating original content and drawing and drawing audience, especially if you have the kind of distribu distribution capacity right. that Apple has. Do, Atlander, do you have a quick thought on what you think their television strategy will be? Well, the problem is uh, not you know House of Cards, but um, live sports, the Olympics, NFL, um, and live events news. I think you know uh, it's getting that content, and you know those industries. Apple, you see Apple. Well, no, if they're going to reinvent the TV, if they're going to have their own TV box, a uh -huh. set-top box, or a uh -huh. TV, or like a giant iPad, um, you know, it's getting that content um, past. You know, instead of getting it through the the cable providers or the networks, you get it through Apple TV instead. And I think the you know the big sports um, franchises are holding out. They don't want to do a deal with Apple. The examples you just gave. Not only are they holding out, but those contracts have been purchased for the next. Uh, uh, quite a few years. In each of those examples, those contracts are already already done. Right. For uh, making up a number for five to seven years, I don't think that's that's far off. Yeah, and I don't think it's ever going to. They're not know. available, in other words. Yeah, and it's not going to it's not going to change. All right, uh, right there, please. Yeah, there's Sorry, introduce yourself to us. Hi, my name is Krista Hickson, and I work for IBM. There's been a lot in the press recently about Apple and what they're doing with payments and a payments platform. I just wonder if you have a perspective. I mean, they've got, I mean, although I would argue that Apple is not, I mean, in a, in a, fight, in, in a fight over dominance in the cloud, I'm not sure Apple wins against Google. Um, but one of the things that, one of the ass, enormous assets that it has is the, um, payments mechanism that it's created as a result of iTunes. I don't I mean, I think the only company that um, is a competitor there is Amazon. And uh, I think that um, they 
when I think about um, Apple and content, I think about the I think about the payment platform that they've created as helping to as helping to drive that. Um, I want to be clear about something though, because I mean I I know we've kind of yacked about this. Apple isn't going anywhere tomorrow or like for the next you know many many years. I think the conversation that we're having is whether or not um, we the prob whether or not Apple runs into sort of a Microsoft problem, which we have seen happen over the course of the past decade. Um, I just wanted to say, just to answer your question, um, you know, I don't think there's any question that payments would be a good idea, but I think the challenge for Apple is in its ex execution. Um, it's always been known as a company that produces products or services or whatnot where it just works really easily. And Apple has shown us through Syria Maps that that ability to for things to work seamlessly without a problem is breaking down. And so the question is whether they can pull it off. Well, I think they're being very conservative. You know, the Touch ID is the payments um, system that they're building, but they're building it very slowly and very carefully and very conservatively. Is that a Samsung phone you got there? <laughs> <laughs> I actually have one, but no, this isn't one. You know, Touch ID, I think, has the potential to change uh, mobile payments, but also security, the whole security paradigm. But, um, you know, the last thing they want to do is do another maps where it doesn't work. So they've limited it to iTunes payments and, you know, um, uh, verification for logging into your phone. But the system behind it is, if they open it up to third parties, you know, could be a, 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 a secure payment system. And isn't that, playing off of that, isn't this one of the big, one of the great unknowns that we really haven't touched on tonight, which is, Everything that Apple has done and has done so well has been for its own system, its own closed system. Even if they build a beautiful payments system, it will only work for selling the things that Apple wants, that Apple is selling, which granted is a lot, but it's not as big as the rest of the market, well, which is presumably what Amazon is thinking about. And yeah, but Google that's why I think CarPlay about. is significant because it's the first time Apple's stepping out of that comfort zone where they don't hone the whole stack. And I think we'll start to see it with things like Touch ID. Yes, please. Thank you. Peter Meyer. <coughs> Peter Meyer, I'm the author of Creating and Dying Markets. You've done a great job of looking at Apple through the prism of what has been, what the models of how business has always operated in the long, distant past, the whole decade now. If I throw that prism out, if I say what has always been is not what I need to look at, where will Apple want to be in a whole different view of a whole different world? Which of you would like to tackle that one? <coughs> well, I think we're starting to see Apple as, you know, possibly the sort of future, the, the Microsoft of this mobile era. Possibly, maybe, I don't know. It's kind of, a, it might be a bit of a stretch. They're starting to branch out, I think, outside of that, you know, the, 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 their traditional <laughs> business model where they own the software, the hardware, and all the services. You know, the App Store is a great example. You know, the App Store is super successful. Um, they've managed to find a, a great way to give this very sensitive platform, uh, uh, developers access to this very sensitive platform in a, in a sort of Apple-controlled way. And um, I think CarPlay, like I said, it's like it's a big philosophical um, change for the company and, and maybe an auger of, of, of what the way that they're going to go towards in the future. I mean, the whole Internet of Things, we're going to start to see um, not just wearables, but, you know, fridges, cars, everything connected to the Internet. And, and Apple having a finger in that pie and especially controlling the interface, controlling access to those different services, I think is something that, you know, the, all these companies are interested in. I mean, they all want to be the OS of your life, Facebook and Google. They're all um, involved in this struggle to be, you know, the OS for all of these different things that, you, that, that you're going to be interacting with. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, put, I'm going to put on my journalist hat for a, for a second and, and because I think it's a great question and, and I think you, you're raising an interesting point. I was thinking while you were talking about this CarPlay thing, and, which I haven't, I haven't had a chance to look at it all yet, but remember before the iPhone, they, they made this awful phone with Motorola. It was called the Rocker, I think. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, it, it was a disaster, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think they sold, I don't think anybody bought any. Not one. But, Clearly, it was informative. Mm -hmm. It was educational. You know, my assumption has always been that Apple absolutely is going to take a big swing again, that it's going to be a major big swing. 
They haven't told us because they don't tell us. And maybe it'll fail. But I think, I've just assumed they will because that's what they do. And if they don't, I mean, in, in 10 years, we'll know that they didn't. For 30 years, Apple's has set the technology agenda. I mean, I think it's always been the leader. It's, it is, you know, from the, the Macintosh or the GUI to multi-touch and a host of other innovations in between, airport, Wi-Fi networking, you know, app stores, you name it. I think uh, for 30 years, Apple set the technology agenda. And, uh, like, absolutely. Including in the dark days, some of that, yeah. some of what yeah, you yeah, just yeah. described. Okay, right. but you two are, are chomping at the bit or no? No, no, no. I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure I'd, I, like from 1990 to 97, I'm not sure that. Oh, some did. of those things happened during that time. Yes, they did, they did the Newton. The Newton. And, 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 no, no, no. I mean, I think the Newton was actually Johnny Ive worked on the Newton. Um, well, to I be actually, fair, he didn't. That wasn't his idea. I don't think so. No, no, no. But I mean, he did. But the answer. But the answer. To answer to answer your to answer your question, um, I think it's personally. I think it's media. Um, um, I think it's media. I think that um, what uh, you know, Apple has the most in even more so even more than Google or any or Amazon or any of the other companies Apple has sort of this um, relationship with consumers um, uh, when it comes to media that is really really impressive um, and they have more money than anybody else and you know it's glib to say that Hollywood is coin operated um, Mark Andreessen likes to say that, and I've appropriated it. Um, but the point is, is you're that saying they're willing to take anybody's money? Yeah, I mean, I think that like people, I mean, p people who make content care largely about like how many people are going to see their stuff and how much money they're going to get paid for it. Whoever can write the biggest check to the people in Hollywood for content will ultimately wind up winning the day since Apple has more, more money than half of Hollywood combined. Um, it's in a position to do that. I'm sort of surprised it doesn't. I mean, go, but go ahead, Dukari. I mean, Hollywood makes plenty of money. And, and I think that like, from their standpoint, they don't have to choose. Why not take everybody's money? And they're going to want to do that, especially where Apple is concerned, because they've seen what Apple does to the music or did to the music industry. And so I think it's really, really hard for Apple to make. Apple saved the music industry. Right. <laughs> you know, for Apple to get out Just there ask them. ahead of everybody they were else. Better than when, Spotify. <laughs> when, well, you know, when Netflix and, and, and Amazon and, and everybody wants it. So why would, why would Hollywood? give it just to Apple. I think we have time. Yes, please. Is this on? Uh, You're on. Sorry, Cheryl Young. I am an executive director with Morgan Stanley. Um, I have a two-pronged question. One is I'm surprised none of you have talked about Nest, uh, Tony Fidel's company, which Google just bought a couple months ago for, a, we think, an extraordinary amount of money. And your, your point being, should Apple have bought Nest? Should Apple have bought mm -hmm. Nest? Um, and, and the, you know, the home smart space, the car smart space, I mean, I know, you know, there's been a lot of rumors on Tesla and Apple the last couple of, of days. Um, I have a Tesla. I love that it updates at 2 o'clock. I can completely see that fit, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm not driving it, that is. Um, typically not driving at 2 o'clock. Um, Hopefully it doesn't get AM and so PM I, confused. I, I, you know, I, I feel like the... the TV's been on the media for Apple for a very long time. And so if Apple's always constantly trying to surprise us, it just seems like they'd want to do something a little bit less profile. I mean, what do you guys think about that space? And then as journalists, do you track people like Tony who've left Apple and started companies and what they're doing? Because Apple employees get a lot of... Um, people calling them daily, you know, from Square, from Box, from all these, you know, small, not so small companies, but much smaller than a 450 billion market cap company. And Apple's sitting on 159 billion in cash. It's a third of their market cap. I just, I can't imagine they're not going to take somebody big out. So what do you think in terms of some of the talent that's left? I know if Johnny Ives left, we'd watch and see where he went because it'd be very interesting to us. To us. Well, I, I'll, I would make the observation to you that, that Tony Fidel and Nest is the exception, not the rule. Very few other examples of, of companies founded by 
ex-Apple executives that have become big and successful. In the hardware realm, anyway, yeah. There's some uh, software ones, but... Such a, as? Uh, I was thinking of uh, Mike Mattis, who went, who's now at Facebook, but did push pop books. And uh, I think there's a whole bunch of start startups. And, um, startups, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know... Uh, so should, to, to her question, should Apple have bought Nest? No, because they don't need that at all. But Google did, because Google wants to get into hardware and doesn't have that expertise. Well, because they already know, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the Nest is no good without your iPhone or iPad or some smart device, and Apple is more interested in the platform than the gadget. I mean, I, I think Tony Fidel was hoping at one point that Apple would buy Nest, and, um, but he's a controversial character, I think. Um, Why do you think he was hoping Apple would buy Nest? Um, sources? <laughs> Did you write this? No, I didn't. I mean, I was working on my book. Um, so, I'm sure Google did. Well, I mean, I think, I think, well, actually, I think that Tony Fidel um, was hoping that Apple would buy Nest because I think he had um, ambitions of, of going back there. And, and you know, I think, um, you know, he, he thinks that he could be the next Steve Jobs um, or the, the, the visionary successor. I mean, but, you know, Tony was a controversial character. I think we have time for, for one more question. Oh, okay. we have time for two more questions. Yes, go ahead. Oh, great, great, thanks. Uh, David Needle, I'm the editor of Tab Times. Um, one of the things when Steve Jobs returned to Apple was he stripped away uh, a lot of the products that they were making because the product line was kind of bloated and they were bleeding cash. Um, now that they're so successful and have so much money, do you think they're being stubborn in how they deal with products in terms of you know, people seem to want a bigger iPhone or more models of the iPad, that type of thing, and yet they keep rigid to this um, fairly restricted line of products. Leander? Yeah, it's always, you know, it, it's always been a very cautious company, and they do a lot of, you know, they do so much R&D. You know, you know in the lab they have, um, I, I, in fact, I know this, because, you know, whenever they do a new product, like the Mac Mini was a good example, they had 12 Mac Minis made from this tiny little, you know, almost like SNL-sized parody of a Mac Mini to this gigantic thing. And, <laughs> and they went through and they just thought, what is the most aesthetically pleasing size? And the same with the iPhone and the iPad. And the iPhone, you know, I mean, it, it, it is its size because you can hold it in your average hand and your thumb will reach all four corners of the screen. And, you know, to, I think to, to, to you know, the, all the ergonomic studies and, all, and in the design department, the idea of some gigantic flablet that you hold up to your ear and you try to dial with one hand is, is ridiculous. Of course, you know, like there is a large segment of the market that disagrees and is quite happy to, you know, buy a six-inch uh, Samsung device. But, you know, they, they, they test all this stuff up in the lab and, they, and it takes three years to industrialize a product like this. You know, three years of setting up the supply chain, the factories, and, you know, they're churning these out, what, in uh, 40 million a quarter or more, 50 million? You know, that is no small bet on a device. And so... You know, Samsung has the, the completely opposite model where they, they churn stuff out and, and see what sticks. But, you know, Apple makes its decisions inside the design lab, and uh, I don't think that's going to change. Well, you but know, if I could restate his question, he's, he's, it's, it, you're asking are they being stubborn or prudent, and you, you think they're being prudent. Yeah, I, you know, I think this year the iPhone 6 is going to be a, is going to be a larger screen phone. And I think that has a lot to do with, um, you know, they also wait for the technology to catch up, and it has a lot to do with low-power chips, low-power screens, better batteries, better, you know, better better communication chips. I mean, no one wants to buy a big phone, even if it's going to look great for 40 minutes until the battery dies. You know, that's not going to sell. I think that, I mean, I think, I, I, I'd agree with Leander. I mean, I think Apple's strength has been, throughout its history, actually, has been its um, pigheadedness about design, almost to a fault. Um, but on the other hand, you could argue that Apple's in the fashion business, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that if you allow yourself to be whipsawed in one direction or another, um, you wind up not only creating, um, you blur your brand. I mean, the thing about I mean, whether or not you, sometimes I, I mean, despite all the stuff I've said today, I mean, the thing that I really do respect about Apple is, is that it makes it clear to its consumers what it believes, what it stands for, and how it thinks. Um, and uh, it's actually prepared to sort of sacrifice, you know, stuff at, uh, f f to take that to take that position. I mean, the one time it did that, the one th time it caved, 
it turned out to be a huge success was when it decided that it was actually going to make a smaller iPad. Um, and that turned out to be um, an enormous uh, success for them. Although, you know, we talk to, if you talk to investors, it's a mixed success, right? Because it's a lower margin product, which has hurt their margin mix. Which that is, is a, true. Which is a legitimate concern. Now we have our last question, please. Yes, hi, my name is Nancy Pistol. And my question is around the Apple retail division. And as we know, it was the Apple retail stores that really brought the Apple products to the everyday consumer. So my question to the panel is, what's it going to take going forward for the droves of consumers to come to the Apple retail stores to add to their success and take them to the next level? Well, the last time I went to the Stone Star store, I couldn't get through the door. <laughs> You know, I don't think they have any, you know, a particularly huge problem with the stores. Um, I think they're going to reinvent the stores, though. I mean, if you look at, again, if you look at the hires, the kind of people that they're, they're bringing on board, the most significant being um, the CEO of Burberry. Um, but they also have been teaming up with some other retail experts, uh, a, a, an executive from Yves Saint Laurent. I think um, that they need to um, transition the stores into, I think they've got a new product line. I think that the wearables that they're working on the most important thing there is not the technology, but the fashion, the fashion aspect of it. You know, I mean, as you can see with Google Glass, um, I think there's a big barrier for a lot of people to put it onto their faces. Um, and uh, this is going to be the problem with whatever wearables Apple comes out with too. And I think the wearables that they're working will be very carefully integrated into, into clothes, or they will be subtle. They'll be a little more like jewelry than, um, than, than gadgets. Do you think, are you, excuse me, do you think we'll be seeing clothing in the Apple stores? I don't know. It would be interesting, wouldn't it? You know, I there's mean, some t-shirts at, uh, at the company store at One Infinite yeah, Loop, but not right. in the Apple store. I visited the mothership, yeah. yeah. Well, um, if you look at Under Armour, it's got a whole bunch of different, um, you know, technology-enabled t-shirts so that the heart rate monitors are actually built into the fabric of the shirts. Uh -huh. And they have um, a headband for football players to detect collisions. And it looks like a regular headband. I um, want to see your wardrobe in a few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You heard a very interesting prediction here first tonight that, that you'll see apparel. Did you want to follow up? With well, I know that. Well, I know it. Sometimes there's been um, technology for emergency location transmitters that you find on board aircraft to be putting those into jewelry pieces or clothing. So I do, I, it wouldn't surprise me if sometime down the road we see a different crossroad of fashion and technology from Apple. And if you look, if you look where they are, they're all on, on the you know, main streets in malls, the shops next door to them, Victoria's Secret and Forever 21. I mean, it's all apparel retailers there. I don't think it's, you know, it's not that hard to imagine. So, like, so, so we could actually, so we could buy like leather jackets that had like little antennas that like stuck up on the epaulets. <laughs> yeah, right. be Get awesome. a better signal, yeah. <laughs> Probably go 20 feet in the air, yeah. We could all be, we, we could become roving, <laughs> roving um, wireless hotspots. That would be so cool. <laughs> would, uh, I just want to say uh, uh, good luck to, to Yukari's book is not out yet. Uh, Fred's and Leander's is, and, it, and they're for sale in, in the lobby. And I just want to wish uh, good luck to all three of you in selling lots and lots of books. And uh, please join me in, in thanking and congratulating Leander, Yukari, and Fred. <laughs>